Thank you all. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for what I know will be a lively series of discussions on the congressional budget process. I'm Margaret Spellings, as you saw from the video, Overexposed. I'm the president and CEO of the Bipartisan Policy Center, and we at BPC are proud to be a partner with TheHill.com to host this event. And we have an impressive list of distinguished guests from current and former members of the Congress to current and former directors of the Congressional Budget Office. And I'm glad to see you all here today, and I welcome all of those who are joining us virtually. Let me begin with this historical note. It was nearly 51 years ago this very day, April the 18th, 1973, Congressman Al Ullman of Oregon, then chairman of what was called the Joint Committee on Budget Control, who introduced a bill that was to become the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act of 1974. It passed the Senate unanimously and with only six opposing votes in the House. And on July 12, 1974, President Nixon signed it into law. It was one of his last official acts before resigning the presidency a month later. And as all of us today know, everything has gone smoothly since then. The act grew out of a crisis, not Watergate, but President Nixon's impounding of congressionally authorized and appropriated funds. In many ways, the budget process in Congress today is once again in crisis. We believe that to understand where we go next, we must first understand where we have been. The law dramatically reshaped how Congress would think about government spending, revenues, and debt, as well as how lawmakers consider, enact, and monitor appropriations. And finally, how this end of Pennsylvania Avenue interacts with the executive branch over spending disputes. It provided a timetable for both establishing a budget blueprint and for completing annual appropriation bills. But consider this. In the last 50 years, Congress has failed 14 times to produce a concurrent budget resolution, and with only one single exception, all the failures have occurred in the 21st century. And Congress has met the October 1st deadline for all its appropriations just four times in the past four decades. And of course, we all witnessed what happened these last few months in which Congress could not reach a spending plan agreement until halfway through the fiscal year. I think we can all agree that an on-time rate of 10% is not exactly top of the class. Since 1974, we've had a number of crisis points over raising the debt limit, the first in 1985 that resulted in major amendments to the Congressional Budget Act. And most recently, last year, we nearly crossed what we at BPC refer to as the X date, that is the date on which the government would catastrophically default on our obligations. This constant cycle of budgeting chaos robs policymakers of the time and space needed to put forward big, bold, and bipartisan solutions to the long-term challenges we face. And of course, the level of debt now approaching $35 trillion has grown from 23% of GDP in 1974 to 100% today, clearly unsustainable. A brighter point is that this landmark law also created the Congressional Budget Office, the nonpartisan scorekeeper for the legislative branch and a critical resource for countless lawmakers, staff, and experts. And that brings us to where we are today. We have seven current and former leaders of those budget committees with us whose leadership spans from the 1980s to the current Congress, and we're about to tap into their expertise. Their wisdom and leadership will make for an engaging set of conversations about the past, present, and future of the Congressional Budget Act. In its audience today is Bruce Meredith, who served the first four chairmen of the House Budget Committee. And watching us from Israel is Alan Schick, one of the framers of the act. I would be remiss if I didn't recognize BPC's own Bill Hoagland, the largest serving staff director in the history of the Senate Budget Committee. There he is in the back row. Yeah. 
that's enough. We don't want Bill to get the big head. Uh, the law's birthday is the perfect time to talk about what's working and what isn't when it comes to the congressional budget process. And while Republicans and Democrats may disagree plenty about spending and tax policies, we all agree that the current budget process can be much improved, and BPC is here to help. With that, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, my friend and fellow Texan. Jody Arrington from the 19th Congressional. I could listen to her Texas twang all day, couldn't y'all? Just Take silky smooth and gives me great confidence that we have an adult in the room. She, uh, Margaret, is a longtime friend. I got my start in this business, so to speak, with George W. Bush and very proud to have served alongside of him and uh, proud of his contributions to this great country of ours. But, Margaret, there was no greater confidant and counsel to the president than Margaret Spellings. And I'm the product of a village of people who made an investment in me over the years. And uh, she's, she would be a chief of that village, and I'm grateful for it. Uh, it has. They say I'm the chief something of my village uh, back home, but uh, it's a different uh, characterization. Um, at the Bipartisan Policy Center, you, you all have, I, I'm in the presence of, of greatness because it's very difficult to get anything done in this town, anything good, anything productive, anything that would serve well the American people, uh, regardless of your ideological bent. And for the tremendous work over the years and those who are, um, who have made contributions through policy or through process reforms uh, to help restore fiscal sanity in this place that has lost its mind and its way. Uh, I'm grateful for your contributions and your leadership. Brendan Boyle is my ranking member. 10% uh, success rate. Are you tired of winning? Huh? You tired of winning, Brendan? Uh, look, the process is not perfect. There, there's no perfect process. And as uh, Tom McClintock is fond of saying, the fault is not in our stars, dear Brutus, it's in ourselves. And too often uh, we point to the process or hide behind it. We need people that are willing to do the right thing, even if it's not politically popular. Uh, we passed a bipartisan fiscal commission, for example. And now I've got Grover Norquist and ATR saying that I'm a big tax guy, you know. And I'm stabbing Trump in the back. This is the kind of bullshit that you have to put up with sometimes. I'm sorry. What it, it, I'm sorry. The Texan came out of me a little bit. But you know what? It lets me know that maybe I'm getting close to doing something that could help the country. I personally think uh, we have a spending, a greater spending problem. Uh, Brendan may think it's a combination. But I can tell you this. Uh, we're not going to solve the biggest issues or the biggest threats or the drivers of our 34 trillion, almost a trillion in interest, more than we spend on defense this year. Wheels are coming off. Okay. They're coming off. And that's, that's a bipartisan statement. The fiscal health of this country is rapidly deteriorating. And in the next 10 years to add 20 trillion to the 34, 62 cents on every dollar being nothing but servicing the debt, not an anti-poverty program or a climate program, not defense, uh, which is now dipping below 3% of GDP for the first time in decades. I mean, the whole world is counting on us like never before. It is a more tenuous situation than ever before. And you know what? It's going to require um, discipline and and new ways to incent people to follow the process, no doubt. But what Trump's process in every organization I've ever been in were the people and the culture. We have to change the culture. That's hard. What they, it takes, uh, what they say, it takes, it's like planting a tree. It takes a long time. The best time to plant the tree was 20 years ago or today. So let's, affirm our faith that uh, Americans of both 
political persuasions and all along the spectrum can come together and recognize that this is the greatest nation in human history. And in my estimation, and it's just my opinion, I won't attribute it to every member of my committee, certainly not my ranking member. I think this is the world war for our generation. And whether the threat is the existential threats like China or whatever, give me your list. I will tell you that this is our world war. This is my generation's Great Depression. And the question is, will our generation make the sacrifices? And it, it's a sacrifice to do a fiscal. It, who would have thought to doing a bipartisan debt commission would be a sacrifice? But Brennan Boyle is a gift from God. He's a blessing to me because I could have had a lot of other members be my ranking, uh, my partner in this. Uh, and they could have made this a political process from the outset. And it could have been just a shirts and skins who can score the most points. Because I've been a part of that, of those committees and that dynamic. And it just, I got three young children at home. I love Texas. I think we can save Texas. I, the question's still in the balance on this country. But Brandon Boyle makes me believe that maybe we can. And we made a commitment to focus on getting budgets and appropriations done, getting them on time, not waiving bu budget points of order because it's easy to do that. Finding ways to bring adult leaders from both parties to the table to talk about the long-term $140 trillion in unfunded liability. Authorizing things before we appropriate them, which it only happens half the time. Um, using reconciliation. You know, we're all, all the Republicans are doing this right now. Maybe we can get the unified Republican control of this town, and I can't wait to use reconciliation. Well, let me tell you something. This budget chairman, uh, every time somebody brings up tax cuts and tax permanency, I'm bringing up mandatory spending, I'm bringing up entitlement reform, and I'm bringing up the real reason we had reconciliation, thank you to our founding fathers of this 1974 Budget Act, which was to reduce the deficit. Revenue was on the table and expenditure. And expenditures. So um, the only way out of this mess in this country is to have leaders willing to work together and um, put their country's interests first. And Brendan, that's the longest compliment I think. I th am I still on Brendan Boyle here? Jim, I need, you better uh, you better get on that bill that we're, that we're going to mark up in our committee. I'll tell you about it later. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Um. So anyway, I, I you all have heard enough from me. We need the community of those passionate about this issue, those who agree with me that this is one of the greatest threats to the country, and that if we fail, unlike our fathers and grandfathers from the World War II generation who were able to not only reduce that at the time record debt to GDP, but to grow our economy and to unleash prosperity and establish America as the global leader. Like that was what was on the line to bring us out of that level of indebtedness. And we did it because we're Americans and because Americans find a way and because ultimately there's more, as they say, that connects us, that unifies us than, than that separates us. Really, if we get out of this town enough, you'll figure it out. Come to Lubbock, Texas. Um, so thank you, Margaret, for your leadership. She's the best. I don't know how y'all pulled that off. I don't know who makes the hiring decisions. I couldn't believe it. But when I heard that, Jody, I'm coming to Washington. And she told me about her new leadership opportunity, the Bipartisan Policy Center, I think, Lord, you're putting all the pieces together. Brendan Boyle, who we don't agree on some things and sometimes widely disagree, but you got to establish the decorum. You have to have the mutual respect. You have to have civility if you don't, and maybe even friendships. Because if you do, it's a lot, it's a lot harder to take cheap shots at him because I like him, darn it. And it's a little easier to meet him halfway on some stuff because I'm just human. So let's incentivize more humanity while we're talking about reforming the process. God bless the Bipartisan Policy Center, everybody in this room who cares about this issue. 
and may God save the Republic and go West Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, oh. I'm ranking member. Uh, I'm going to uh, draft Jody to come with me to Philadelphia and introduce me now for every speech that, that I have. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll say a little more about Jody in a second. But first, uh, let me just say, Margaret, and to everyone at the Bipartisan Policy Center, Thank you for pulling this together. Uh, as I look out, uh, what a remarkable room of, of individuals and longtime friends and people uh, for whom I, I have such great respect and admiration. Um, so it is an honor to be, uh, be amongst you. Uh, I also just want to uh, echo um, what Jody said, and I, I feel fortunate you know, we were friends before he became chair and I became ranking member. And I remember talking to him on the House floor a couple of years ago when we're, it was clear we were both going to be separately vying for these positions to respectively lead our sides and saying, wouldn't it be great if we both got this? Um, so as you can probably tell, we have a genuine friendship. And on day one, we both, Jody, obviously as, as chair, and me as ranking member, attempted to set the tone and basically said to our colleagues, look, there are certain committees in which you see the food fight and the invective and the nonsense, the performative BS. That's not going to be our committee. We are going to do serious work we disagree, we will have those disagreements, but it'll be based on policy, not on personalities. And I have to say, and it's a credit to, to Jody as, as chair, um, a year and four months later, we have really stuck to that. And I have gotten compliments from members on both sides who have talked about the tenor in that room. And if any of you uh, observe our committee hearings, I hope that you have, have noticed this as well. Um, in terms of the, the 50th anniversary of the Budget Control and Empowerment Act. Boy, I remember when 50 used to sound so old to me. Um, as, I get, as I'm get, as i getting with, uh, within striking distance of that 50-year mark myself in a couple of years, uh, thank God I work on Capitol Hill, where you're considered young if you're under 70. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I would observe that if you look at any reform, and obviously the Budget Control and Empowerment Act came out of reform. Most reforms generally follow a similar pattern or cycle. First, there's a problem that many perceive the need to fix. Second, there is the reform that is enacted. And third, while it initially works, as time goes on, you start to see things drift. I think that we are uh, following that same pattern when it comes to the Budget Control Act. Uh, we have seen increasingly in recent years a failure to pass appropriations on time, to even get the proposals out by the stated statuary dates. We have also seen uh, the hyperpolarization within both major parties contribute uh, to that dysfunction as it relates to, to the Budget Control Act and the budget process. So I do think it is time to look at reasonable bipartisan reforms to our budget process. I am excited and can share with you that um, ideally, as early as next week, a piece of legislation that I have and that Jody is my lead um, co-sponsor, the CBO Data Sharing Act, will pass the House of Representatives. It was passed out of committee unanimously. And that will give the Congressional Budget Office more tools to collect the data they need from agencies so they can better serve, uh, serve Congress. One of the great initiatives that grew out of the Budget Control Act of 1974 was the creation of the Congressional Budget Office. And I wanna say publicly what I've said before to Mr. Swagel privately, and just how much respect I have 
for the almost 300 uh, employees of the Congressional Budget Office, who, especially in this era, work in such an admirable and nonpartisan way. Finally, while there are many aspects of the budget process on which I could focus, there is one aspect, and it doesn't come out of the 1974 Act, but it clearly is part and parcel of what has been going on, uh, certainly every, if not every year, every couple of years. And Margaret alluded to it, to it in her opening remarks. As the dysfunction has increased here and the polarization has increased and it's a negative reinforcing cycle, we have seen the emergence of the debt ceiling become weaponized. This is one of the greatest threats we face to our economy. This is a hostage that should never be taken, uh, but increasingly is. In the summer of 2011, July, August, we came dangerously close to crossing that X date. And then again, last year, we came ever so dangerously close. I have legislation uh, simply called the Debt Ceiling Reform Act that would improve that process, that would attempt to take it out of the realm of the political food fight and inject some rationality into how exactly the debt ceiling is raised. So recognizing, as one of the speakers in, in one of the videos said earlier, in Washington, D.C. today, especially in an era of split government, for something meaningful to pass, it will have to be bipartisan. But one of the process reforms that I am working on diligently and we need to pass before the next debt ceiling fight in the spring and summer of 2025, not that far away, we need to finally at long last come up with a permanent solution to the debt ceiling process. Because if we don't, I mean, we are playing with dynamite. We have to be perfect every single time. It only takes that one time for the X date to be crossed. And then uh, the Lord knows um, what the sort of uh, havoc that would be wreaked after that. So I look forward to working, continuing to work with many of you in this room so we can enact smart, meaningful, bipartisan reforms to our budget process. And it is uh, in, in furtherance of that noble goal that I am honored to be with you and working with you. Thank you. Congressman, thank you, and to Chairman Arrington. So let the conversation begin. There are brochures on your chair with bios. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to introduce our illustrious panel, beginning with Secretary, former Chairman, Congressman, OMB Director, Leon Panetta. Thank you very much for being with us. Senator Don Nichols, Congressman Gratison, to um, our good friend John Yarmouth, and to Senator and, I'm sorry, Senator and former Attorney General Jeff Sessions. I'm pleased to also... I have Michael Schnell as our moderator. She is one of the youngest, brightest reporters for TheHill.com and News Nation, and she will begin our conversation. So thank you all for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you all for being here. For our panelists, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to start off with a bit of a pessimistic question, but maybe you all can inject some optimism into it. Secretary Panetta, we'll start with you. Is the budget process that was set out in this 1974 law irre irre irrevocably broken? And can it be fixed if so? Uh, Congress hasn't completed its full budget process since 1996, and but does that really matter anymore? Well, first of all, thanks to uh, Margaret and thanks to uh, Bill Hoagland for organizing this event and thanks to the Bipartisan Study Center uh, for doing this. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize the uh, Budget Act uh, and uh, what the purpose was for establishing that act. I tell the uh, students at the Panetta Institute that uh, in our democracy, we govern either by leadership or by crisis. If leadership is there and willing to make the tough decisions that are involved with leadership, uh, then you can avoid crisis or certainly contain it. But if not, we'll govern by crisis. And I think if you look at the history of the budget process, 50 years, it really is two chapters. The first chapter 
running about 24 years, was successful. We passed budget resolutions. We followed the Budget Act. Uh, why? Because of leadership. Look, strong leadership from the presidents. President Bush. We passed a budget agreement with Bush. We passed a, a, a strong budget with President Clinton. And as a result of that, we were able to ultimately balance the federal budget. Uh, we had, as you saw in these pictures, strong leadership on Capitol Hill. Whether it was Bob Dole or George Mitchell or Tip O'Neill, Bob Michael, uh, the leadership was supportive of the budget process. There was no question that you had to pass a budget resolution. It was not subject to political input as to whether or not you should do it. We did it. And the members and the chairman, you know, whether it was Bob Jimo or Pete Domenici, uh, whether it was uh, Don, whether it was myself, uh, you know, we were able to do it because the leadership said you got to do it. And the members supported it because members in those days placed the nation ahead of party and felt, really felt that governing was important. So that was a period where leadership really did uh, enact the, uh, the budget process. The second 25 or so years, obviously, uh, is not a celebration, but is a memorial to a, to a broken budget process. The budget, budget process doesn't work. And the people on the budget committee know it. It's broken. For a lot of reasons, probably mostly because of leadership. Leadership does not want to step up and make the tough decisions. You have to deal with entitlements. You have to deal with taxes. You have to deal with discretionary spending. You have to deal with defense spending. You know, when we sat down and did the budget agreement, we put all of those pieces together. It was a compromise. It was a consensus, but we did it. And you know, the problem right now is the budget process in the last number of years, the only reason it's been used is for reconciliation. For those of you that aren't familiar with reconciliation, reconciliation was a tool to reduce the deficit. That's why it was designed to reduce the deficit. The reconciliation has been used because it's a, it's a way to avoid a filibuster in the Senate. It's been used and passed in order for both parties to pass things that added to the deficit, didn't detract from the deficit. So in the end, can this change? Can people of goodwill ultimately come together and make the tough decisions? It's going to depend on the leadership. It's going to depend on whether people are willing to take risks. This is not politically popular to take on some of these issues. I understand that. But we did. And let me tell you, ultimately, because we did it right, we also benefited politically because we did the right thing for the country. So the real question today is whether the next 24 years is going to be a, a repetition of chapter one or of chapter two. There, it will depend on leadership. And there's a lot in there I want to unpack, but I want to stick on this idea of leadership because Secretary Panetta, you served on the committee at the same time as Congressman Gratison. At one point you were chairman, he was ranking member. And during that period of time, you guys were actually able to come up with a budget resolution, have that concurrent resolution with the Senate. Uh, I'll go to you, Congressman Gratison. How exactly did you do that? Be able to find that consensus in today's political world? That seems like it would be, uh, you know, something of a mystery. And do you have any advice to lawmakers currently of how they can find that consensus on such a such an important topic like the budget? Well, I had uh, the experience of representing the Ways and Means Committee on the Budget Committee. I believe there were four seats reserved for Ways and Means, and the committees were very, very different. We did a lot of things, not everything, a lot of things on a bipartisan basis in ways and means. Interesting what happened, our, our chairman, Daniel Rostenkowski, would go to the Democratic leadership. He told us this. Major bill was coming up. Are we open to working with the minority or are we not? They would decide. He would then meet with his members, tell them what it was, and then later in the same day with us and say, I can or I can't. If I can, it's all you all, whether you want to join me in acting that way. So we had this environment 
where we became accustomed not only to working on easy issues, but we had some tax bills. We basically had the entire reform a bill that saved the Social Security system in, in 1983. We had an assist for, uh, from the, uh, it was a concern whether it passed the House. Speaker O'Neill was against it. Claude Pepper, the great historic leader of the elderly in America, was against it. Uh, but uh, we were able to uh, uh, act in part because Alan Greenspan had a commission which sort of gave it a seal of approval. And, uh, and it was uh, passed on a bipartisan basis. About uh, four months after we passed it, after Congress passed the Social Security reform, which is sort of on point because that was had spending cuts and tax increases and extension of the retirement age and all. I ran into Alan Greenspan over the Senate dining room. We were waiting for our host. I said, Mr. Chairman, congratulations on your achievement. Big smile on his face. I said, I'm thinking of uh, nominating you for the Nobel Prize. He said, oh, the Nobel Prize in economics? I said, no, the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> and I think that's kind of how I felt at the time. Uh, the, uh, on, from the minority point of view, um, as I saw it, the a budget was a committee, a majority was a, a leadership committee, like rules at that time. Rules right now, I don't know who they represent, but certainly not the speakers here from the news I read every day. We'll but that was different at that. It was different at that at that time. What advice do you have to lawmakers today to sort of replicate that that camaraderie and bipartisanship? Well, I think part of it was the, the process, and that is we were guaranteed the right to offer a substitute budget every year. So was the Black Caucus, as I recall it. Occasionally, someone else might be able to uh, to do it, but that was the way it worked. So ultimately, it, it, it quite different from some of the things that happen these days. We were told we couldn't at least let the, let the House act its, express its will uh, and it had only uh, by a choice of something or nothing. And uh, I think that was a, a, maybe a minor point, but of some significance. Senator Sessions, I want to move to you now. Uh, something that the Secretary Panetta mentioned was this idea of the filibuster and how the budget reconciliation process is a way to move around the filibuster. Uh, we've sort of established already that the Budget Control Act is a bit broken right now, and uh, or some folks would argue maybe a little bit more than a bit. Uh, there's obviously always bubbling conversation about doing away with the filibuster in the Senate, something that is now creeping up even more with Senators Cinema and Manchin leaving. They were big proponents of the filibuster. If the filibuster would be to be removed, would that sort of be the last straw for this budget reconciliation process? Well, the budget reconciliation avoids the budget, avoids the filibuster, and that's the power of it, as uh, you said. So I'm not sure. I'm not for that. I know the leadership of uh, the Republican leadership, McConnell, and uh, the establishment crew believes that if there's no filibuster on legislative matters, then the Senate becomes another uh, body uh, of the day. Uh, whatever the current mood is, and there should be some ability for the Senate to slow the process down. Uh, I, 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 I'm thinking that uh, based on what the comments are saying here, I would like to push back a little bit. Uh, I don't. I learned in the Senate, big things really don't happen unless there's a fight over them. And it can't be for just a day or two. It goes on for months, and the people start choosing sides. And I've been in several fights and thought I was going to lose, but when the polling numbers start moving, votes start moving. Mm -hmm. And I don't think much anymore that you just go to your colleague and say, I want you to change your position you've been taking for the last 20 years, you know, and help me out pass this bill. And they don't want to do that. So... I don't, the, the shutdown, government shutdown is in not a very good way, but it does provide an opportunity for a battle. And if I'm not mistaken, the last budget that was balanced was after Gingrich uh, fought it till the blood was all over the floor and people were yelling at each other. Uh, but President Clinton started moving and the polling numbers started favoring the people who were saying, let's get this budget under control, and, and they balanced the budget. Um, and uh, the Republicans lost a few seats, but they didn't lose the majority. 
they still held a majority. So I guess what I'm saying is I think you can fight for containing of spending, but and not lose your seat. That's the first thing. And I do believe that the people on the side of restraint, it's 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 the Congress and the leadership in the country that that seems to be in this unreality of the of the unprecedented level of debt we've reached. And I think we can all say we are in a danger zone. Let me just throw this out as a possibility on, on to everybody. What happened when I was ranking on the budget committee, President Obama appointed the Simpson Bowles, and they came back with a bipartisan support plan to reduce spending. Paul Ryan, I give him a lot of credit. He built this complex, you know, plan to bring the spending down. And uh, so I was thinking, I'm at the ranking in the Senate, and I'm thinking, well, why do I need to try to write another one? So I'm just going to support Ryan's plan. And then Rob Portman, they met at the White House and all these things. They came this close, but it didn't happen. And that was, has not been a real knockdown debate since then over the budget. Nobody is paying attention to this. Uh, if you want to read Rogoff and Ryan Hart's book this time, it's different. I quoted it during those debates at that time frequently. Uh, it was saying 80, 90 percent of GDP, uh, if your debt reaches that high, uh, you're in, uh, heading to a fiscal crisis, and that's over 100. So we are in a danger zone. Nobody's talking about it. So I think y'all putting this together needs to begin a national discussion because it's not a little matter. It's a serious matter. Great. Sure. Bringing the discussion back to the filibuster quickly, um, Congressman Gratison, if I have it correctly, you are in fit. You 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 are of the belief that without the filibuster, the Budget Act would not essentially be necessary. It's not a point that I particularly emphasized. I was trying to concentrate on things uh, that were uh, within our responsibilities in the in the House. So I think you may have some seriously someone else in mind. But I I do want to emphasize the human side of this. Uh, in particular, pay tribute to Leon, who, when he was chairman, we worked very well together. We, we ended up different at the end of the day, but uh, quite apart from budget, uh, he and I, along with John Heinz uh, and and, uh, and Bob Dole on the, in the other body, uh, got behind the and succeeded in legislating expansion of Medicare to cover hospice over the objection of the Reagan administration, a strong objection. And uh, I want to tell you a very quick story about that. Uh, I argued it would save money. That wasn't my reason for supporting it alone by any means. The administration, the OMB took an opposite view. So I asked them to come up over the numbers with me. So these two folks came up, sat down. This was before a lot of the electronics. They spread out their, all these sheets of paper. There was a savings here and there was a cost there. And at the bottom, they said, and we multiplied to come up with our numbers. We multiplied it by the units of production. They said, those units of production or terminally ill Medicare patients. I still am in shock about that, that meeting. And I only mention it as a reminder to myself, as well as to others who are maybe listening, that behind every one of these numbers, debt, spending, appropriations, are human beings. And, and uh, I really don't think this whole thing's turned around to the public, it's stirred up. And I don't think it's stirred up until they're, they're directly affected. That's why I personally think well, it may be a while off and that it will be at the time that we, quote, save Social Security and save Medicare, or that we have to demonstrate something to do other than just borrow to pay pensions. That's, that's when you know your country is, or your business isn't really going down the tube when something like that happens. Congressman Yarmouth, I want to bring you in here. Talk about the legacy of the Budget Control Act of 1974. Uh, do you think it's a positive one? Because in the beginning years, it was used to reduce the deficit. And then there were the Bush tax cuts. And then we've had the Inflation Reduction Act. And it's since been used at, at a way that has increased the deficit. So looking back on 50 years of this law, is the legacy a positive one or a negative one? Um, I don't think it's particularly positive. I would say, and this echoes something that Brendan Boyle said, I think the creation of the CBO was a huge step forward. And uh, 
my my uh, work with the CBO over the last, I've been, I was on the committee for 14 years, ranking member for two and chairman for four, uh, was extraordinary. And, and the teams there and the work that they do are really, really helpful to the work that Congress does. Um, in terms of the budget process itself, I think we're probably asking the wrong question. I, I think we have to look at, say, there's nothing sacrosanct about a budget resolution. The 74 Act stipulated that we do one, uh, but I would ask us to go through an evaluation as to whether over the last 15 years or whatever time frame we're dealing with here when we haven't had a budget resolution, whether the result in terms of what the top line numbers are would have been any different or significantly different. I would argue you can make a case they wouldn't have been much different. So is it better for leadership of both sides? And obviously, this has to do with the partisan um, composition of the, of the government. So if, if you have one party government, uh, three House, Senate and presidents, that's one thing. I've lived through every permutation possible of House, Senate and, and uh, White House. Um, but the numbers are probably going to not be that much different. So if we didn't spend all of that time deciding whether to do a budget resolution, and our decision was pretty easy in my four years as chair, because the Senate wasn't going to do one. So we said, why would you do it? And the, question, and the answer is you wouldn't do one because in the partisan environment we live in, and this is the reality, most of the mentality in Congress is an electoral mentality. It's not a governing mentality. So it's whatever the issue is, how do we gain an electoral advantage over the other side? And the budget resolution proposed by whether it's Democrats, Republicans, the Black Caucus, or the president is just more ammunition for the other side to run campaign ads and uh, to get talking points. So. Um, I think that's a fundamental question we have to deal with as, as a Congress is it's really a youthful process because if we didn't do that and the appropriate and the, the leadership came up with numbers in um, in February or March and then the appropriated started working in February or March, you might get spending bills done by October 1st. So I, I just think that, again, <laughs> celebrating... Uh, I know Bill didn't like, was questioning whether we should say celebrating the 50th anniversary. Recognizing the 50th anniversary may be a real opportunity to step back and say, what is the best process? Is what the, the Budget Act of 74 prescribed the best process? And I'm not sure it is. Senator Nichols, I want to bring you into the conversation. Let's talk about the parliamentarian, who's this figure who really plays a pretty key role in the budget reconciliation process. Do you think that budget reconciliation process gives too much power and authority to the parliamentarian who is an unelected figure, but again, has so much influence on, on what could become law here. No, I, I was in the middle of a lot of those key issues, historic oh, issues. I remember many, many times trying to make sure we carved an amendment that would uh, pass the parliamentarian's uh, <laughs> guidance, but that's not the big issue. The, the, the budget process is absolutely broke and it needs to be repaired. It's unconscionable to think the United States government wouldn't have a budget. And and shame on us for not letting it happen. Leon was right. He said, we need leadership. And I served in those first years. Leon was elected in 76. I was elected in 80. And and we never even conceived of not having a budget. That's right. it was, that was a job to do, and we we're going to do it. I was on the committee for most of my 24 years in the Senate. and and. Uh, and it's not a, the most enjoyable committee to serve on. <laughs> you don't gain a lot of points, Senator. Don't make a lot of friends. Yeah. <laughs> but it needs to be done. Shame on the Senate for not even trying. My compliments to uh, the House for passing a budget, even though, as the Congressman mentioned, and in the split environment that we have today, as partisan as it is today, we know you're not going to end up with a, with a, a conference, uh, conference report, right. a budget conference report. But it needs to be done. And hopefully we would obtain the leadership and maybe, but it takes leadership from the presidential candidates, both of our presidential candidates, President Biden and former President uh, Trump. They didn't bring up, you've never heard the word deficit unless it was used in a way that wouldn't be exactly truthful. 
<laughs> you know, so they didn't care about trillions of dollars. When I was elected, the federal government spent $600 billion, spent for a year, $600 billion. They were passing appropriation bills, called it COVID, called it infrastructure, call it uh, emergency, whatever, you know, in the trillion, 1.2 trillion, one point some trillion. One, and, and now you look at CBO talking about hundreds of billions of dollars of fraud and waste and so on. I'm still getting notices. Oh, your company can qualify for, you know, loans that you, you know, PPP and all this kind of crap that Congress just threw out the window with no guidance. So the budget process is absolutely broken. Both sides have used reconciliation not to cut spending, not to reduce the deficit, but frankly, to expand government or to expand uh, tax cuts that maybe they couldn't get through in the normal operating process. Shame on, I say shame on, they took advantage of the rules as the rules are. And and I, I participated in that. So I I'm, I'm, can't say I'm innocent of that, but, but to, it's certainly not used for deficit reduction. It's been used to cram through an agenda. And I shudder to think, right now we have divided government, so you don't have the reconciliation bills through. I can see I could see an expansion of government if the Democrats take control of, of all uh, the White House and both houses of Congress of, oh, let's, uh, let's fix Social Security by taxing all income for Social Security. That will fix the problem. As, as Bill mentioned, you guys solved it with a combination of, of increased uh, uh, eligibility age and, and a big tax increase and some re reforms. And some of us thought, well, maybe that was too heavy on the tax side. I can see it being all done on the, on the, and, and, and all the candidates are saying, let's don't touch social security. I'm, I received social security. I'm getting COLAs. Last year, a 7% increase in COLAs. That's ridiculous. So I want to hop in here because we were almost out of time, but I want to get one more question. And I want, if you can all just quickly and, and, and in a terse way, have your answer here. It's been pretty well established that the 1974 law has not been abided by, that has not, you know, is, is broken at this point and not been abided by properly. How can Congress be incentivized to abide by this properly? Again, we're almost out of time, but we'll go down the line if everyone can just give a quick thought on that, starting with you, Secretary Panetta. Well, look, again, it's either leadership or crisis. If if leadership is there and willing to make these tough decisions that are necessary, then I think, you know, ultimately the members will respond to that kind of leadership. Because, look, this is a place that operates by the rules. It has to operate by the rules. You know, sometimes it doesn't look that way. But the reality is you set rules and you have to abide by those rules. Uh, I think that ultimately it isn't. It isn't something that is going to happen right now. I, I don't envision an immediate change because I think whoever gets elected, I mean, Trump will do a big tax cut. Biden may very well do spending cuts or spending uh, proposals, uh, and they'll use reconciliation for that purpose. We know that. I think ultimately it may very well require crisis, and that crisis is coming. We've got a $34 trillion, $35 trillion debt. We are paying more interest now than, than defense, for God's sakes. And it's going to keep going up. It'll eat away our resources in this country. And ultimately, it will undermine the economy, especially with Social Security and Medicare going broke. So we're headed towards a cliff. We have to go over that cliff. I don't think we do, but I'm afraid sometimes the only way we wake up is when a major crisis is facing the country. Senator Nichols, how do you think that Congress can be incentivized to, to abide by the 1974 law? And again, if we can just keep our answers short, we're running out of time. Well, we need adult leadership. And I see Senator Sessions, I think of Senator Gregg, I think of a lot of people that I've served with. Uh, they were very concerned. They were good leaders. They wanted to make significant changes. I think if you don't have leadership from the White House, uh, it's probably not going to happen. People aren't going to get too far in front. Um, they might, but but if you have the, the president saying, I'm not going to support that, you know, let's don't do that. It's not going to happen. It's not going to become law. So we need leadership both in the White House and from Congress. And I, I'm afraid, but I happen to agree with Leon 100 percent. I think it'll take a crisis. I think the crisis is not that far away. If interest rates keep going up, 
Leon mentioned that interest expense already exceeds defense. And if interest continues getting higher, it, it uh, can reach a crisis point much sooner than people anticipate. Congressman Gratison, your thoughts here? I, I agree with the crisis theory I mentioned earlier because we know it's coming with Social Security and uh, Medicare. I do think that uh, it is important on both committees to try to do things that encourage at least a sense of understanding about the basic facts and ways and means. We had an annual retreat. Uh, American Enterprise Institute and Brookings put together a, 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 a faculty, we called them. We spent the whole weekend together, one year working on taxes. Jim Baker was secretary, came up there, boots and all, spent the whole weekend drinking and talking to us about taxes okay. and a lot of other things that were important in Texas. And uh, but the point, I think there's something to be accomplished. When I was ranking, I sat down one by one with each of the new members. Some have been elected. We're going to go to Washington. We're going to solve the problems of spending in taxes and we want to get on the budget committee and get it done. And uh, Better or worse, I said to each of them, welcome to the budget committee. The best part of being on this committee is you get a really good seat for the hearings. Uh -huh. Well, it was a while later that they came to me and said, I think I understand what you were trying to say. <laughs> and I think that lack of sense of participation is something that can be done uh, short of actually in the short run uh, uh, ending in uh, action right anytime soon. Congressman Yarmouth. If until voters... Uh, reward members of Congress for being bipartisan and compromising, uh, nothing's going to change. Uh, and that's, to me, the biggest problem we have in this country right now. Members of Congress are penalized for working with the other side and not rewarded for it. Senator Sessions, your thoughts here? Maybe we should term limit the appropriators. That's a phalanx. Anybody wants to cut spending in the House or the Senate, it's got to go through the Cardinals, and that's not easy. They stick together. I mean, kind of serious about that. Um, you do. So, um, all right, I think this, this panel could be great. The bipartisan, we need to start the discussion. It's not out there now. One person said nobody's talking about it because it's become unreal. The numbers are so big, nobody even attempts, even Congress, to think about the significance of the amount of debt we're adding, okay? So I think you could do that. I warned that interest would on the debt would exceed, what was this, 14? It would exceed Defense Department expenditures. I warned that interest would go up. I warned that these debts were going to call inflation. But what happened? Interest rates went to zero. Inflation was virtually zero. Not zero, the interest, but interest was really low. So nothing's happened. And so we now we, uh, that was all stupid. You know, are we in the new economy? We've got a, a new world, and this time it's different. And so I think now all of a sudden interest rates are going up. It is more than Defense Department spending. Uh, inflation is heading up, and I think we are in a big danger. Uh, you know, the great economist died last year, Julie Andrews. He says, nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could, right? Uh, how can you? Uh, so one writer said recently, why are we borrowing so much money? It's to buy prosperity today by burdening the future. So I do think it's a moral thing, and uh, I don't believe either presidential candidate is going to be able and will even consider abandoning their message and start talking about cutting Social Security, do y'all? It's got to come from the kind of the grassroots. And, uh, but I think the crisis is so real, and. Uh, Simpson Bowles would say the nation has never faced a more certain financial crisis because it didn't really happen. Well, how many years ago, ago was that? A decade. <laughs> but that doesn't mean it won't ever happen. And the percentage that we were raising at that time of uh, the, a debt to GDP was about 80, 90 percent, and now it's over 100, well above what? Rogoff and Reinhardt said always results in a financial crisis. So 
Yep. Thank you. Well, thank you. Before you all leave, before you leave, Secretary, we want to get a picture. So if you could just pose for just a moment. You can't leave yet, but we want to thank you all. Michael Schnell, thank you very much for a terrific job. We appreciate it. We're just going to uh, get a quick photograph of all of you. Again, thank you very much. Michael, terrific job. Thank you. Secretary Panetta has a plane to catch, so we want to accommodate that as well. Again, gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Safe travels, Mr. Secretary. Michael Schnell of the Hill, thank you very much. We'd like to now welcome our next panel, including the 10th director of the Congressional Budget Office, one of our hosts here for this event, Phil Swagel. He is joined by a number of his predecessors as they get on the dais. Dan Crippen, Doug Elmendorf, Keith Hull, Douglas Holtz Eakin, Robert Reichauer. And let me also welcome another colleague from thehill.com and News Nation, Mike Vicker. He is a veteran congressional and White House reporter. He is now the Washington Bureau Chief for News Nation here in Washington. The panel will get underway momentarily. Thank you all for being with us. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. No matter what I drink, it's not going to make me any smarter. Well, this is great, and uh, I, I don't feel I deserve to be moderating such a distinguished panel, seriously. Uh, Doug, you go right with that chair there? You want me to? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you, well, this is really an extraordinary moment because, as uh, Bill Hoagland and Margaret have pointed out, the 50th anniversary of the Budget and Impoundment Act, as Bill Hoagland continually reminds me that that is the full title. Um, you know, as a reporter who spent 12 years every day in the halls of Congress, uh, the CBO is something that I spent hours waiting for the result of perhaps your most uh, visible work product uh, when it comes to reporters, and that is, what is the score on the legislation? Because when you were director of the CBO, you all had to be careful about what you told your client, which was the member, members of Congress, about the policy choices and trade-offs they made. So you either play the role of a hero or villain. Uh, you're either an impartial and principled caller of balls and strikes, or you're a misguided bureaucrat using faulty economic assumptions. <laughs> and that depends on the agenda of the person sitting in judgment of you. Uh, so during your tenure, CBO could also serve as a convenient scapegoat, scapegoat for members of Congress who might not be able to pass legislation, depending on how you scored it, how you evaluated it, and the costs of it. Uh, so we want to discuss your time at CBO uh, and remind you that, with the exception of the gentleman to, the, to my right here as uh, the current director, you are unbound from Congress today. <laughs> so, oh, no. In short, you can tell me. And, yeah, well, please. Let loose, man. <laughs> So uh, please, uh, this is your opportunity to tell us what you really think. Um, but I am going to start with uh, perhaps, I guess, to use the parlance of today, the OG of the CBO, Mr. Reichauer at the end of our table here. I remember uh, I started uh, as a journalist in this town as a producer for NHK Japan, Japan Broadcasting. Reichauer was a famous name uh, in Japan, um, owing to your father's work. Uh, and then Reichauer was a famous name in my work because we were very focused on the product of the CBO and the economic assumptions that you made. So. Tell me, you were at the beginning with Alice Rivlin, uh, the creation of the CBO. How do you see the changes in the mission now and the different challenges that are faced by Phil and what you faced uh, back in the 90s? Well, uh, back when CBO started, uh, it wasn't as big a thing. Uh, and I tell a little story, which I probably shouldn't tell, which is the... Um, uh, the uh, deputy director of CBO came up on the hill about in year two or one and a half uh, and was walking along and ran into his classmate in graduate school. And the classmate in graduate school said, you know, what are you doing up here? You're, you're usually in California. And he said, well, I'm the deputy director of CBO. And this individual said, who's a member, uh, what's that? <laughs> and he explained what it was. 
that individual ended up, uh, his name will go un, unreported here, uh, as one of the leaders in Congress, I mean, one of the top leaders in Congress. And it shows you, we weren't a big deal. Uh, we were a big deal for the Appropriations Committees, the Ways and Means Committee, because, you know, we were in their turf, so to speak. Uh, but the job was relatively easy compared to what it was. Uh, were there hostilities? Sure, I got called up uh, all the time by a ranting member uh, who didn't want to trust this important rant to one of his staff and screamed at a lot. Then you hold the phone a little bit away and it went on. And the next day, I'd be on the podium and he'd be giving a speech as well. And he'd say, you guys do terrific work. <laughs> and so you might start out with the hide of a rhinoceros to survive in this job, but pretty soon, you know, your skin is tough. Uh, and you realize that the vast majority of members uh, are supportive, as the individuals who were on this panel, supportive of CBO, what it's doing, realize that they and their interests might be affected negatively today, but the institution as a whole was better off in that there was agreement on certain basics of uh, economics, fiscal policy, and policy uh, analysis. Okay, uh, I'm just going to ask the group, and you can answer one by one, or argue, or speak over each other, or agree with each other. And, and again, I'll use my experience as a reporter from the perspective of, of someone who's reporting to the public. It used to be when the CBO, or the budget was released, there was a big lineup before dawn at that big brick monolith down at uh, North, North Capitol Street, the government printing office. And everybody wanted to get the first look at the budget. Now, granted, it's online now, so you don't need this gigantic dead tree edition of the budget. And there was, then there was a photo op when the budget was delivered to the Hill. I remember watching Jim Nussel walk in with the budget, and we all took pictures of him. It seems less relevant to the discussion now. And I'm wondering why that is and, and whether or not that is something that should be rectified. Dan Crippen. Why do I have to start? Because <laughs> you're, um, you're next to, you're next to right, okay, Mr. Reichel. I always got put at the front of the class because of my last name. I mean, oh, I'm yeah. Okay. Fair either. Um, well, that, as we've all said, uh, everyone has said here before us too, the times have changed. Um, and the budget is not as relevant because it is not part of the discussion. Um, and for your colleagues and, and your past, um, it, it, it's contention that it gets reported. And while we certainly have contention on the budget, if you go seek it out, it's not what makes the headlines. Or it's not what has your interest or, or reporters' interest. And so it's not as big a deal um, in that sense. And as uh, the panel before us, a couple of members talked about, uh, when you have $2 trillion deficits, um, somehow it's unreal. Yeah. You know, it's different if you're 60 billion away, and you can put that in the context of the programs. Yeah. But uh, 1.7 or 2 or whatever the big numbers are, they'll have relevance to people and therefore to reporting. But uh, just aside from the news value and what I do, um, isn't it also a reflection of the fact that current resolutions don't get passed anymore? And so it becomes less, the, the process is, as has been noted here, seems to be broken. Doug. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks for the to be here. Um, years ago, I ran into uh, former Governor Michael Dukakis at uh, TSA screening at the Reagan Airport. And oh, yeah? I said, Governor, thank you for your service. And he looks at me and goes, thanks for remembering. That's how I feel today. Thanks for remembering. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so I'm, uh, I'm going to just um, steal from Phil Joyce, who's sitting over here somewhere. He, he's uh, in the process of finalizing a very nice paper on uh, this, this topic. And one of the things that, that I think that he writes, and I think is absolutely true, is that CBO as an institution killed off OMB and the interest in the president's budget. It used to be that you needed the OMB numbers. You needed the president's budget. It's, it, it set the tone for all the discussions that were going to happen in Congress. That's not true anymore. Congress wrested control of the budget from the executive branch with, with this act. Right. I wish they would now possess it more fondly and, um, and take care of it a little bit. 
but that was the whole point. The whole point was to take control of budgetary um, uh, deliberations. And now they don't want to own it. And that's the fundamental problem. Which results in CRs and omnibuses and... And Doug, what's... Uh, Mr. Elmendorf, what's lost? What's lost? What's lost in that? When I got to CBO, my colleagues, some of whom are here in the room, would refer to me as Doug too. <laughs> um, I'm happy to be here with Doug and, and in the Rayburn building. A little lot to be sitting on this side of a hearing room. You're telling me. <laughs> um, well, so I think uh, what I cared about as director were the budget plans of the members of Congress for whom I worked. And the president's budget was interesting, but not central to the work of that day. But I think what we've lost through not having uh, budget plans that are taken seriously by from the administration or from members of Congress is we're not setting strategy. We're simply trying to survive. We as a budget-making government trying to survive from one day to the next, and that's no way to run a serious government. But it, it, the point, as was pointed out, is that the, the budget and and Impoundment Act of 1974 was an effort to take control, the power of the purse back to the Congress, to the people and the representatives here, Keith. Um, what have you found to be lacking in the process and what do you think should be done to correct it? Well, it's not followed. Yeah. Right, and, and I think, I, I, I even hate to focus on, on the process because it's a process you don't follow. So you're gonna fix something and then not follow it. You're not, you're not gonna fix it. Uh-huh, how do we get people to follow it? Well, it's in a danger of changing the subject a little bit. I think the Please. biggest problem with the budget is we lost our fear of debt. And we lost our fear of debt with low interest rates at the Great Recession. Because mm. for decades, we ran a, uh, a debt around 40%, up and down. And when recessions would hit, we'd be afraid of running the, the debt up. So we'd let monetary policy work. And low interest rates made us think, okay, and this is part of the advice Congress got, low interest rates means the Fed's not going to be able to handle it. You're going to have to use fiscal policy. And we used it big time in the Great Recession. We used it big time in the pandemic. And all this debt that we've got now grew from that Great Recession. We had, we had debt of about 40%. It was hovering about 40%. We're at 100% now because we just don't fear debt. And so whatever happens with the budget process and anything else, if you don't fear debt, then it doesn't matter that much. I see, Phil, you furiously taking notes there. So I'm just going to let you... Uh, let uh, you... I, just, I, just, I just, I'm writing down some thoughts on what's the same and what's different, which is kind okay. of... Yeah, and, and obviously some of it's from me and some of it's from talking to colleagues, um, many of whom are here. And I, I should just first say I benefited from everything they did. I mean, it's really an amazing group. It's really, it's really spectacular. And and I, you know, I know we're missing some of the spectacular people, uh, you know, including, of course, Al Sirlin of, of blessed memory. Um, and so, yeah, I've benefited from everything. Sometimes we joke we're still cleaning up your your, your messes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's that Elmendorf. Yeah. Actually, I I did want to say, oh yeah, that was Doug's fault. And <laughs> the, the staff I was talking to got it. <laughs> This Doug's fault. That, that, it, <laughs> wait, it worked. That, that worked. That worked. So um, I'll really just say quickly, the same. And it's, um, I mean, there's so much is really from Alice. And it's the mission. Um, it's the uh, analysis and process. Um, and, of course, the people, you know, for who, when there's the friction, is, of course, the people who already know the answer, right? If you already, you know, you have the tablets from Mount Sinai, you don't need us to tell you, well, you, know, um, you don't really care what the analysis is. Um, so that I think that's the same, and I, I know from my colleagues and my predecessors that those those frictions are are familiar. Um, getting the answer in the time available is a you know not always getting it right, but getting it in the time available, landing the plane on the runway, um, uh, and of course people want it faster. Um, I'll say the thing that's still the same also is the culture and the people. And I'm just I'm looking out and I, I see so many CBO alumni. I bet you could come back and still feel at home and. Um, if you know anything about the farm bill, we'd put you to work right away. Um, <laughs> more dangerous than you think. Um, uh, so a lot of that is still the same. Uh, I mean, there's so much that is still the same. And actually, that helped us so much making it through the pandemic um, and through the remote, you know, the period of remote work through the pandemic. Um, a few things that are slightly different. Um, and again, this is just a matter of degree. 
Um, you know, one is transparency, which I, again, I inherited everything. I benefited from everything they did, and especially Keith really pushed this, and we've continued. Um, and it's, you know, we're still continuing, so we're sort of in the middle of the slope, but it's really been a big, um, you know, I think it's a, a good thing for CBO. Um, uh, and then I think this is really a matter of degree, is the way we work. And when I talk to some of my colleagues, that's what they say, is that in some sense, the process of our work is maybe more iterative or the faster iteration, which it's always been that way, but is that somehow the thought was that the process of technical technical assistance is is different. And maybe that's, I don't know, maybe that's a splintering of the Congress and there's says so this we're we're, you know, dealing with multiple sides with their multiple committees in the same, you know, in the same chamber. And yeah, so I'm not sure, but that, you know, that is um uh that that's something that uh, many of my colleagues have observed just feels different in, in the way we work. Okay. Um, I'm going to go deep into the weeds here, at least from my perspective. In this room, it's not in the weeds at all, I'm sure. And that is the subject of dun, 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 dynamic scoring. So it seems to, to be a recurring issue, not just on the tax side of the equation, but on the spending side as well. Recently, the House passed a bill requiring CBO to help lawmakers evaluate the impact of preventive health care legislation. So I understand, uh, Director Swagel, you've testified uh, that the CBO is well positioned to take this out. So what is the status of that debate now? Is that pretty much given now that dynamic scoring is going to be uh, implemented or used whenever making scoring estimates? Okay, maybe I'll just say a little bit. I know okay. others can, uh, will chime in. Um, and we built on, on their efforts and we're, we're doing it. And the agency did it actually just before my, before my time for the um, 2017 Tax Act. Um, we did it for immigration, which that was Doug, Doug too. Yeah, Doug too. Uh, immigration, we're doing it again. We're looking at um, dynamic effects with with other things. Um, if there's major legislation, of course, the House rules tell us to do it, and, and we certainly would do it. Um, and and we're, importantly, we're looking beyond the 10-year budget window, since, of course, there's so many policies that have long-term effects um, in health care and in, in other things. Um, so that, that's another aspect of a, of a change. Anyone else? So, we, so, I, so, so I, I would say I think... Um, I think it's important for CBO to extend dynamic analysis to more legislative proposals. Um, I thought that when I was at CBO and we did some work in that direction, um, I wrote a Brookings paper as soon as I finished advocating some of that. I'm actually writing a Brookings paper for the September conference with Glenn Hubbard and Heidi Williams uh, that we hope will help CBO to constructively engage on more sorts of dynamic scoring. Um, this is super hard to do in many in many ways, and I, having lived through trying to do this in some cases, I understand the difficulty of that. But I also think that there are a lot of legislative proposals for which one gets a somewhat different sense of the impact on the budget by incorporating more effects for which there is a growing body of economic evidence. And so I think done cautiously um, in the right circumstances, more of that would be useful for the Congress in making decisions. Anyone else? On I've always thought that. And um, I did. The, I led the first dynamic score at CBO. Um, uh, it was essentially a litmus test of my appointment as, as director at that time. How so? That, that it, the next director should do a dynamic score. Dynamic score is going to save the republic, and we're going to cut taxes and end teenage pregnancies, and God knows what else. With dynamic it's scoring, good. yes, it's all good. And so we did it. And um, the the central features of the of the president's budget that year were the 2003 tax cuts. That's what they wanted. And it was also uh, the Medicare Modernization Act. The Part D prescription drug program was, was in that same president's budget. And we concluded that it would have a modest effect somewhere around positive or negative uh, impact on the growth of the economy. And I thought that Congress would conclude that if you combine program tax cuts with a big lard of spending, the net is zero, they concluded we did it wrong. And, uh, <laughs> And the rest has been picked up by these folks. <laughs> yeah, I was just, um, when I was there, we were still fighting what we thought was a good fight, resisting uh, dynamic scoring for tax cuts in particular. Um, one excuse for that resistance was that the statute says we are very be responsive to the budget committees, the appropriators, the tax writers. Um, and so none of those committees were beating on us to say that felt to dynamic scoring. Uh, part of my response, too, was that CBO was always done dynamic scoring. 
um, because you look for effects, and the side in particular, how many people are going to sign up to a program? That's part of the assumptions. That's dynamic. I mean, in the sense of you're looking for the changes of people, whether they're paying taxes or building the economy. And uh, but we were we resisted doing it, but we put in place a lot of the modeling we thought would be necessary. And uh, then Doug uh, wisely took the president's first the first presidential budget he had and used it to populate the, the models. So Doug took the, what the budget said, put it in the models, and produced the result we talked about, which was brilliant uh, in, in many ways, something I never thought of. But it also opened the door, and I, I don't know where you close it. And I look forward to Doug Two's. Uh, uh, paper on you know, which programs might be amenable to it, and I can understand there would be um, immigration is a classic case of how much how many people go into the workforce, um, you know, as a one component. But where do you stop? Where do you start? Um, how much a dollar on education produces? Where um, spent in what way? I mean, it just uh, uh, again, uh, I was not a big proponent of export then, and I think it, it does open a, a Pandora's box potentially. As a footnote to this discussion, and in the spirit of what we heard from the, the panel with Horace, the most important thing we had to do to actually do the analysis is, is formal computational models require that the budget be on a sustainable trajectory, and then you can evaluate changes in it. So the first thing we had to do was essentially make up how is this thing going to be sustainable, because even then it wasn't, and now it's much, much worse. <laughs> Mr. Reichar, I see you taking notes there. Yeah, well, I served before this became yeah. a huge uh -huh. so I just looked with humor on the reactions of my uh, <laughs> successors. And uh, it was always thought that this introduces even more uncertainty in the an uncertain process. Uh, it is likely to increase uh, controversy. Uh, it uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of expertise. And you're likely to begin treating certain issues with a whole panoply of uh, tools and others without that, because there isn't the data, there isn't the, uh, the acceptance of uh, the analysis. Um, and, you know, that's all fine, uh, but Congress uh, likes it simple and it likes it fast. And it takes a long time to do a lot of these things. There's an outfit up at Yale that's just been um, formed which I wish well, and uh, they're very good people, mm -hmm. and it will enlighten all of us, I think, and help CBO, mm -hmm. um, you know, and the Congress moving forward. Um, but I always viewed this a little bit like, uh, for cost estimating, it's the hamburger helper, you know, mm -hmm. add a little bit of this, and maybe you can get more of what you want out of the cost estimate. And overall, the impact is not going to be huge on certain things, uh, doing analysis of immigration. Very important. Uh, all for it. CBO has always done analysis of particular uh, subjects uh, that have shed additional light on the impacts overall beyond the budgetary impacts or secondary budgetary impact. And that's been useful. Mr. Current Director, you said you wanted to... Oh, I just, I just had one last observation, which, which I think build on, on some of these others, which is that dynamic scoring, I mean, the dynamic scoring and other things, I think, highlights the secret. It's, it's the secret sauce of CBO, which is not having normative views, which I mentioned before. And, you know, as Bob said, having someone with normative views, if you say, well, you can do it this other thing and throw in other, other things, well, it's it's another... This is a channel for normative views to prevail. And not having normative views, you know, letting the chips fall where they may is just such, um, it really is the foundation of what, of what we do. Um, I'm sure it's the same as the same in the past, the word basis. Like that's the word that we just, we use every day. Is, well, what's the basis of that? It's just a generic CBO question. And, you know, we have to be able to answer that question. In that sense, it's just the secret. Uh, well, just one small thing. I think when I started, there was the beginning of a requirement to do the dynamic budget. I see. And um, every single Democratic member I sat down and talked with had one question. How are you going to do the dynamic score? And the answer was, we'll give it a dynamic score and we'll give you the 
non-dynamic score. I remember all, that, yeah. And it was all, oh, okay. Kind of like the real concern was one of trust. Wow. I mean, were we going to make it obvious what the dynamic effect was? And is it in a way where they, they could, frankly, just... So that, was sat that satisfied everyone? <laughs> I, I think the, the issue of um, <laughs> transparency um, was, was brought up, alluded to earlier. Um, my understanding is CBO does not publish its models, if I understand that correctly. I understand that CBO posts segments of the computer code for some analyses, uh, but after nearly 50 years, should there be more competition as it relates to baseline scenarios? Should private forecasters, I think uh, one of them was referenced, mm -hmm. and others examine CBO's work and provide alternative views? Um, I guess it's the idea of scientific reciprocity. Anyone want to jump in on that one? I think this is a, a horrific idea. Um, <laughs> so there is a big difference between uh, transparency and scientific replicability. And I think um, it will confuse those as being the same thing. They're not. Um, there's this somehow this presumption that there's a model for everything. And that that's, that's what CBA does. They turn on the model and out comes the answer. And that's absolutely false. We hire, train, and pay the CBO staff who are fantastic exercise their judgment. Scoring is a judgment science. And you make a judgment about the most likely path for receipts and outlays as a result of the piece of legislation. And that's the job they do. Models can inform your judgment, and formal models are helpful in that regard. But I promise you, there is no model for scoring terrorism risk insurance. Hmm. I mean, it's the federal backstop to the private property and casualty industry in the event of an unknown terrorist attack. At an unknown time, in an unknown location, using an unknown weapon. Terry Gullah told me it was 50 billion bucks. I believe her. <laughs> right? <laughs> what else could it be? There's no model for that. So, I mean, there is this misconception that there's a model for everything. You publish the model so other people can use the model. Uh -huh. And they can then do the scoring at home in their, in their free time. That's not at all what is going on. All right. Uh, yes. So, can I echo and also add something? So, the echo is um, Bob Sunshine, who's here um, and has been at C CBO since 1976, I believe, served as deputy director with me. And um, everything good that I did, with half the credit, should go to Bob. Um, Bob taught me when I came to CBO um, that models don't make estimates. Estimators make estimates. So it is the people who bring the judgment to bear in all these ways. So I, I, so I think there should, I don't think it's a good idea myself if CBO published models, because people would presume they could then do a CBO estimate. But I would draw a little distinction with some of the outside groups. You mentioned the people at Yale who are just starting. There's a group at Penn, the Penn Wharton yeah. budget model people, who developed a lot of expertise. In fact, hired away some people from CBO, unfortunately, to help do that. I think having other groups trying to do some estimates in a serious way can be helpful. I mean, their credit, they have to demonstrate their own credibility. Mm -hmm. I think the folks at Wharton have, unless they understand it, I think the folks at Yale have started last week, and we'll see. I think they have to build credibility, but I think it's good for other people to be trying to take seriously the challenge of taking some legislative proposals and assembling the evidence that's out there and trying to help offer information about them. I, I, I want to just second that. I think that's really important. It, you know, when I was director, essentially the only com competition was OMB, and OMB, for a whole bunch of reasons, um, uh, became less and less of a competitor, mostly because they don't do mandatories. So they're not doing... Mm -hmm. Most of the budget, mm -hmm. they don't do the tax. Mm -hmm. So having these other groups to to do benchmarking and comparisons with is really important. I think one one aspect of this, and it uh, is a counter um, to what my colleague said, is that I do think there's some responsibility to make known some of the most critical, important assumptions. Um, not the not the code, oh, not all of the judgment goes into it, but are these assumptions roughly correct? You have to make assumptions to with a dynamic or with a, a system like this. You have to make assumptions to get the result. You can't observe everything in between. And so those assumptions often can affect, if not drive, the results. We ought to let people know what those assumptions are because that's where you could accept um, legitimate input. Um, you're not necessarily biased. doesn't matter the source. Are those assumptions right? What other data and studies can you bring to bear? I think that's an important piece of transparency at CBO, and, and Keith did a lot of this when he was there. Yeah, and, and I agree, and, and to their credit from Congress, that was a lot of the feedback I got, was mm -hmm. not we want to see your models, but tell us what your assumptions are. That, that seems like the right thing to do.
Yeah, I was say, I think the work of Penn Warden is really incredibly good. They're very fast, and sometimes, um, you know, sometimes they're, um, you know, fast has there's some trade offs with being as fast as they are. And, you know, in student loans, for example, um, you know, we just, we have data that others, well, we have data that Department of Education has, but doesn't really um, use, you know, use fully. Um, and, uh, you know, others don't have it. So, um, you know, student loans is an example where, you know, we and, you know, really have an advantage just as the, the data. Actually, we're about to lose that advantage unless Congress passes legislation, which hopefully will happen. Um, this is now, uh, Federal tax information. Um, uh, I'd say, you know, again, Penn and um, is you know super big fan. Yale, their initial you know initial set of papers is you know is great. Is mostly really really good. Um, I'd say climate. So we've we we do a lot of work on climate. It's something we started in the summer. Or, you know, started more. They all you know everyone before me did lots also. But I think we started more in the summer of 2019. You know, knowing that you know the administration was not going to you know put forward. Um, legislation for us to about you know evaluate whatever, but knowing it would take time, and it's an area in which of course people working in the area have such strong normative views that I think you know we really have a place for doing that, and you know someone without normative views who's not an advocate you know who really is just trying to get it right that um you know I, I think it's, it's a really important area for CBO to to basically keep doing what we're doing. Okay, and I'll, I'll say w one of the. Feedbacks I got from from members was that we couldn't do work for them. We said we had to work for committees. We had to work on on what was going to make it to the floor, and we pushed towards go, going beyond just the estimates. We get into interactives, where you would set up a model, you'd set up a result, and and set up a little model that had give them an idea to see what well what happens if productivity is higher, what if it's lower. If nothing else, that gives them a feel for how confident we are in the number. How much uncertainty there is, because that's always a challenge is communicating uncertainty from these point estimates. Mm. Okay, a question for the entire panel. I mean, obviously, you work in a political environment inherently. Um, how hard is it to manage a nonpartisan, objective, independent organization that must advise and report to what is clearly a very partisan oh. Congress in a partisan time? Keith, would you like to start with that? Um, well, when things got controversial for me, I, frankly, a large part of my job was running interference for staff. What do you mean? I would spend a lot of time in a member's office. Somebody was upset. I would go explain things to them. I would, I would be careful about bringing people with me because I didn't want them exposed, honestly, to the somebody's angry or their oh, really? Because I wanted to be fearless in what they were doing, that they were making the right. Not shrink back in anticipation of somebody's reaction. Exactly. And, and when things got bad, we even brought in speakers who would speak. I tell CBO how great they are. So, so to remind them. So like Tony Robbins would come into the CBO. Yeah. And <laughs> to remind them that, that they're, they're doing good work and they shouldn't be afraid. That's not how I roll. <laughs> All right. Douglas Holtzig and how do you roll in this partisan environment? Um, uh, so I, I, I just want to echo that, you know, it is your job to, you know, the, the director signs everything, the director owns everything, and it is your job to defend everything that is not the staff's. And it is utterly inappropriate for any elected official to go after a CEO staffer. That's a line that I just will not uh, tolerate. Um, it was pretty easy for me, to be honest. People have asked me a, a, a lot over the years, sort of, how, would, how do you think about being CEO director? Would you be CEO director again? I always told them no. Because one of the things that made it possible for me to do my job is, I didn't know anybody on Capitol Hill. I didn't give a rat's ass about anyone on Capitol <laughs> Hill. I just, my peers were out in the research community and I wanted them to be proud of the work that we did. And that's exactly the right mindset to have. Huh. And I couldn't do it now. I know too many people yeah. and um, I would care what they thought. I didn't care. And that made it much, much easier. So take care of your people, uh, you know, stick to the research and findings and, and you do a good job. Um, I'm getting the wrap, so I'm going to ask for closing thoughts uh, from each of you about the way forward. Always want to end on leaning forward. Let's start with you, Mr. Mr. Reisha. Uh, I agree with, I think, the universal uh, judgment that uh, CBO, the creation and the development of CBO is really the high point of budget accomplishments in the last 50 years. 
uh, and uh, it owes a lot of the success to uh, the founding director, Alice Riblin, and the markers that she put down. Uh, it wasn't written that this was going to be a nonpartisan as opposed to a bipartisan number of um, inquiries I got about bipartisan just the first few years uh, was amazing. Uh, it was not given in stone that uh, TBO would not make recommendations. Uh, it was not apparent that CBO would speak independently. The first product we produced actually came out in a committee print uh, when we actually put out a uh, pamphlet of our own uh, on some topic. Many were surprised. There are a lot of things which people, you know, the, the law did not specify what we were supposed to do, and the House and the Senate didn't agree anyway. And just to give you uh, one example, uh, it never occurred to Mellis or me or any of the other family people that we wouldn't do an independent economic forecast upon which our estimates would be based. Uh, we happened to have uh, Alan Blinder here as a visiting fellow, and Frank DeLeo from GW came as a head of the fiscal policy staff. We uh, put together uh, an economic forecast. It was leaked to the Washington Star hmm. and uh, the chairman of the budget. I remember committee. that paper. Yeah. Uh, 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 chairman of the budget committee, um, Ed Muskie, called up Alice when he heard about this. And I was sitting in her office and he said, What the hell are you guys <laughs> doing? Why are you putting out an economic forecast? We have the presidents. Uh, you know, Alice pointed out that the Congress might want its independent forecast. The president was a Republican. Muskie was not. It, became, it was a controversy until six years later when uh, David Stockman introduced us all to Rosie Scenario uh, that having a separate uh, independent view more like the blue chip uh, consensus would have some value for Congress. So there were lots of things that were decided uh, and then built upon by a set of directors. And the directors, to a person, reflected Doug One's view. They cared about what their colleagues before CBO would think of them and their independence. And no matter what kind of baggage or views that they might have as they came into office, they were going to do the most down the middle, sophisticated, intelligible analysis that is what Congress could want. And it turns out Congress did want it. They didn't always know it. <laughs> but over the years, uh, it, it has been uh, really quite supportive at the same time as being. Uh, Critical. And, yeah. Uh, you know, I think all of us spend a lot of time in members' offices, uh, dealing largely with the staff's displeasure that something yeah. out had done, uh, and the uh, member nodding the whole time. Thank you very much, Mr. Reichauer. And I uh, uh, just studying up in the days leading up to this, I realized that everybody owes you and Ms. Rivlin a debt of gratitude for your uh, establishing. Okay. Uh, Mr. Crippen, final thoughts. We reflected what my first uh, thought was, which is Bob gives Alice a lot of credit, and rightfully so. But he was also sitting there with her much of that time and deserves a lot of the credit for as well for establishing the benchmarks and processes that we inherited and still use. Okay. Um, I mean, all of us, of course, think that CBO is a valuable institution, has been and will, we hope, continue to be. Um, it... Uh, the only thing that I can think of offhand that I would advocate for is, is more of the, some of what we've said here about revealing assumptions. Um, spending a little more attention, at least uh, from my time there, to what others have to say. 
um, it can be a bit of a cloistered uh, institution. You have to protect uh, not only the staff, and it is up to the director to absorb the incoming. Uh -huh. um, but you also have uh, you know, critics of, of other kinds that may have legitimate things to say. And we can't just deny that. And I don't, I'm not saying that, that that's all of that's all the case, but right. I think we do need to worry about taking more. Okay, I'm getting a, a hard, in the TV business, we call this a hard wrap. So I'm gonna give each of you 30 seconds or so if there's something else you'd like to conclude with. CBO is so good at its mission that people are always tempted to give it another one. That would be the biggest <laughs> mistake. Let it do its job and continue to do its job. All right, Doug, too? Um, I think the power of CBO comes from its staff. It comes not from the, half dozen of us here, it's the 200, 300 people who've, who've, who've made the place what it is, who help the director stand up to members of Congress because the analysis is good, uh -huh. um, who have knowledge and understanding way beyond what any of us, I believe, could put in our own right. heads. And the power of CBO in the future is to make sure that it keeps attracting the best possible staff. Thank you. Keith? Well, I've been always impressed with how much that CBO does now, it, it did from the very beginning because they kind of got it right. The one thing we haven't mentioned that I think they take on very well is, is accountability. They evaluate their estimates. They evaluate their projections. How did they do? Uh, and, and not too many places do that. Right. Yeah. Final word to the current director. Yeah, I'll just end and just say, uh, I think the key for us is to take a long view. And, and as they all said, to keep, keep doing what our mission is and to stay focused on that and, and do it the way that, well, really that Alice set it up. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. That was thank very, you. very, thank you. Right. We're yeah. going to ask you to uh, stand for a moment. We're gonna get a picture of all of you. Mike Vaccara, thank you very much. A fabulous job, we really appreciate it. So as that panel gets off, our final panel, we're pleased to welcome somebody who is a veteran of both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. Shalonda Young spent uh, about 14 years on Capitol Hill and now she, runs the country through the OMB. And a conversation with Margaret Spellings, we should point out that Senator Sheldon Whitehouse was invited to be here. He is tied up in the Senate, uh, so he is not here with us at the moment. So we're pleased to have a conversation between our president and the OMB director. And that will begin momentarily. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Director Young, for joining us. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for a fantastically fascinating uh, panel. Uh, well, as Steve <laughs> said, you have had the benefit. And may I say this? We're going to end on time because uh, Director Young has a child to get to. And, uh, you know, we value our priorities. If, uh, and if you knew me on the Hill, everyone's still like, oh, my God, you had a child. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nicer and softer now. Oh, yeah. No, I'm senior. I, it's easy to be nice and, to, and soft to that precious Charlie of yours. All right. Well, so you have had the perspective of being at both ends of, of Pennsylvania Avenue. And, you know, obviously, I've been a member of the executive branch and the president's budget process and all of that. Uh, talk about where you see things now. We're here to talk about and commemorate, not celebrate, uh, the Con Congressional Budget Act on its 50th anniversary. What are your observations about what's working, what's not working, particularly given the two perspectives you've had? That's, How long do we have? <laughs> yeah, that's a loaded question. I want to make sure to get to other questions. Yeah. Um, I want, Hi, Terry. How are you doing? It's good to see everyone. Uh, that's the problem with coming back home, right? You mm -hmm. see, uh, see all the people you got to work with uh, for a long time, um, uh, and that has been beneficial in my current job. Having more interaction between the legislative and executive branch is a good thing. Uh, have having people understand the ebbs and flow of the the House and Senate when they uh, are in the executive branch. Uh, so I'm able to at least say, well, wait a minute, how's the Hill going to react to that? Um, because I think, you know, we have political realities. Uh, there are some process things we absolutely should look at and work on. We haven't had on-time appropriations bills all done on time since 1994, I believe. 
uh, when Obi and Bird, uh, Obi was my first boss, uh, was uh, were chairs of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee. So you can't look and say it, it's all working. Mm -hmm. uh, the good news side of that is it does get done. It's just really ugly. Uh, and it's a grind for the people who work on those things. And people ask me how I can have a two and a half year old now ago because I've worked for the Appropriations Committee. Uh, <laughs> and my schedule's better now. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, the, you know, it, uh, you, there, there, we have to take a good look at what processes can be fixed, if the data's right, what, what, what are the best processes to make uh, this easier? But at the end of the day, we cannot ignore that the politics of today are different than they were when the Congressional Budget Act were written. Um, and you can have all the good processes in the world. We have a two-year budget cap deal now. Doesn't mean we're gonna be on time. Um, because it's politically difficult. We have tighter majorities. Um, and it takes a lot of hand holding and relationships. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I've gotten to do some version of this for 23 years. Um, and I know a lot of people I can still call and we can have those conversations. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I can't do that. Um, and they can say the same thing to me. And the more you lose that and the more turnover you have, uh, it makes it makes uh, a tough situation uh almost impossible. Yeah, one of the things that came up in one of the panels is this issue of debt and deficits and that it's uh, your uh, folks ahead of you said that, you know, it, debt and deficit doesn't matter as much. I mean, there aren't those same guardrails, that same kind of, you know, what are the rules of the road and so forth. Yeah. Um, and so the wheels are off a little bit. And so how do we either restore that or reframe, you know, what are the rules of the road and how we get people back to kind of respecting processes, regular order, whatever. You got to know what outcomes you're trying to achieve. Um, we say these things, get on a better fiscal path, uh, regular order. What, at the end of the day, what are we trying to accomplish? I, you know, especially for the, the appropriations process, you want something that does not generate news headlines about potential shutdowns every three weeks or eight weeks. Um, if it gets done and it feels smooth November 1st versus October 1st, I will not lose sleep. As a matter of fact, I might go through a party <laughs> uh, of some sort. Um, but what to me seems unhealthy uh, in our democracy, when the American people start to get nervous about appropriations bills, that concerns me. Um, I grew up, I never heard of an appropriations bill in my life, and that was okay. Um, so, the, you know, it is a process that should be one of the the things we do because it's our job. I mean, it isn't tough, um, but we got to find a way to stop having a process uh, that makes America feel a little rocky. On debt and deficits, we have to have a fiscal path, in my opinion, um, where smart economists tell us what a healthy level, a percentage of GDP debt is, and we don't hit each other over the head on the on the overall number, but know what our healthy margin should be, what our real net interest is as a percent of GDP, and have an honest dialogue. We're going to carry debt in this country. Uh -huh. It's a large economy. But what are some healthy parameters that make sense? No one talks about that. You know, I go to here and like 34 trillion debt, it is a lot. It's too much. But if you talk to any economist, they will tell you there are markers that make sense where it is. Uh, where the economy is going along, we can afford the investments in the American people. You know, I answered a question at a hearing. What about a balanced budget? What, that, what does that mean to the American people? Mm -hmm. It sounds fine until you hear what that does to Social Security and Medicare and the Medicaid. And then what are the costs of people not having those safety nets? We're going to pay for it one way or another. So you're, we, we've got to figure out a way to take it out of the political environment and talk about what are those measures that make sense from an economic standpoint um, so our economy is healthy and have levels that allow us to keep having investments. And frankly, to me, you know, we do scorekeeping, CBO, OMB. It's hard to change scorekeeping rules on purpose. Mm -hmm. Those are the kinds of things that keep everyone honest. So we, we are very reluctant to change those things. Uh, but in my view, you know, I think if some smart people that are not me and other people who work for elected officials are elected, sit down and go, you know, there are some programs, maybe like childcare and early education, 
um, that are more investments that might have uh, longer term benefits outside the 10 year window, maybe we should look at those differently. Um, and all that answer goes back to we got to find a way to take it out of political process um, to deal with debt and deficits, but to deal with define what deal with is. And a lot of times we don't have that conversation. So you all at OMB obviously kick off the budget process with the president's budget, what I used to call the one day budget. <laughs> but maybe you can steal that. I don't know. But it does. It's a, it's the opener. It's the yeah. proposed to be disposed, et cetera. And, and you all, I'm going to put two questions together here you know, have a lot of priorities, obviously, student debt, climate, et cetera. I mean, how do you think about establishing your priorities and kicking out, kicking off that process and, and stewarding it all along the way on behalf yeah. of your of your boss? Uh, remember, we talked about regular order and process. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, we get we get a lot of flack. You're not on time. You're not on time. And I hope he took this in the uh, fashion in which it was delivered. I meant it, but, you know, in jest. If you give me an appropriation bill on time, I'll give you a budget on time. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a month late. We, we got our bill six months late. And he goes, well, you don't need last year to be finished to do next year. Like, you should. <laughs> yeah. you absolutely should. Yeah. Um, and either we take this seriously or we don't. Uh, if, if the budget is built on things that are not real and out of date by the time you get it, then you're going to get what, you, what process you put into it. Um, if you think last year's budget shouldn't inform next year's budget, then you're right. You are you are setting the stage for this process not making, mm -hmm. not being taken seriously, and that's where uh, we are now. So you're right. We should be the kickoff. Um, but this year, I was testifying on our 25 budget as Congress was releasing the details of 24, and people were like, "Why is this program lower than this?" Like, because I didn't know what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know it was my best guess. Yeah. Um, but trust me, we support that program. You all just went a little higher than I, th I thought you would. Um, so it's difficult. It's not always a start. Sometimes we are finishing as we start. Uh, we're doing Ukraine and Israel and uh, Indo-Pacific now. Um, uh, but supplementals have, you know, I started my career on the Appropriations Committee doing disaster response. Supplementals are always something uh -huh. we do off cycle and they're incredibly important. Um, and you know, I, I think the Probes Committee got me ready for, uh, speak of prioritizing priorities. Uh -huh. I just replaced a bunch of appropriations chairs with cabinet secretaries, uh, <laughs> like your former job. So I'm used to having those conversations. Uh, as Joe Biden told me, I get a budget every year. It doesn't mean I don't support them because you don't see it in this one. I um, mean, you have to have priorities. You have to worry about the fiscal path. This is a president who believes in showing a pathway to deficit reduction. You ain't got to agree with it, but he's had a path to deficit reduction in every budget. Um, and he finds that incredibly important. So everything can't happen in every budget. Uh, and it's a tough job, but I'm, you know, uh, got to do that in other ways uh, in prior career. So yeah. you, you, you have to have priorities or to me, if you don't prioritize, you care no about nothing. Um, and priorities show that you actually push for and care about the things that you bother to put in your budget and push for. Again, it doesn't mean you don't care about the other things, um, but there's a time and a place, uh, and it is a political process, um, to put your eggs in those baskets and go and fight for it. It sometimes takes years. Yeah. It sometimes takes years. You mentioned, obviously, politics and, uh, you know, helping the public understand and maybe, maybe naively build kind of momentum around demand for, you know, fiscal stewardship and setting priorities and those sorts of things. What can we all do, you all do, uh, to enhance tr transparency and public understanding of the budget process in, in a way that makes sense to them? That's an interesting question. Um, one, I think groups like this can, when I spoke about taking things and dialogue out of the political process, I have conversations that it's hard for us in D.C. in these jobs to have? Like, what, what is an acceptable level of debt? What, what are the markers? What economic markers? What, uh, you know, clearly interest rates when this presidency started were historically low? That's, you know, you're going to make different decisions with regard to your fiscal path depending on where interest rates are. Um, but having people like the Bipartisan uh, Policy Center and others 
think about what those things are so we aren't just shouting, well, this is the dead number. Isn't that too high? What What is the trajectory here? Shouldn't What are smart indicators to suggest uh, what target should be across presidencies? We have democracies, four, four year intervals. What are those markers administrations, regardless of party, should be shooting for, and the public can hold us responsible to those rather, rather than using blunt instruments uh, that we know really don't tell us much uh, about what we're trying to achieve. Um, I think that would be extremely helpful and something that's hard to do in this climate, but groups like yours mm-hmm. uh, can certainly help us do that. Well, and comment on that specifically as it relates to what we're going to face in 2025 with the tax cuts, the prospects of the uh, debt limit, you know, those sorts of things. I mean, what advice do you have for us and and what are you going to do about it? <laughs> uh, the last debt ceiling nearly broke me. <laughs> um, You're not the only person I've heard say yeah, that. It was that, one, that one nearly broke me. Um, look, I... I'm looking at Doug, I came to Harvard, I think, a few months before we did debt ceiling. And I think I said to the new members who were there, let me tell you what's going to happen. With lots of ideas about how to deal with the debt, we're going to hold the debt ceiling hostage. And then when it becomes too politically untenable to talk about Social Security and Medicare, everyone's going to say, well, let's cut NDD. NDD is 13% of what we spend in this country. If you care about fiscal path, that ain't how you fix it. Uh, and Head Start and NIH did not get us into any of the debt issues uh, we have uh, today. Uh, and this lowest common denominator, low-hanging fruit, those programs are incredibly helpful and an incredible safety net. Um, and we target them because they are part of the appropriations process that happens every year. Um, and it doesn't really deal with the bigger problems. And that happened. Um, and, you know, the, the greatest success that I worked on the debt ceiling was that the, the budget caps, in my view, were two years and not 10. Because uh, I think they're incredible investment. When you tell the American people what non-defense discretionary is, they go, we should be doing more of that and that and that and that. Um, and, you know, it gets very, um, very easy to, to lose what we're trying to achieve as a country um, and have real honest conversations, especially um, when elections are coming up. But I hope in 2025 we have more room um, from a political standpoint to be honest with each other and sit down in bipartisan fashion. And let's talk about what we are trying to achieve. Where, where are we trying to end? Uh, in our view, and we'll keep saying it to the cows come home, revenues have to be a part of any conversation about fiscal health in this country. It has to be. You know, I get, we had surplus in 2001. Taxes as a percentage of GDP were 19 and a half percent. They're not that anymore, around 17%. We have to have a conversation. Then they go, ah, oh, that was an outlier. Um, so it has to be a fulsome conversation in our view. I also don't believe that conversation has to happen by using debt ceiling right. as a political tool. Our estimate was if the debt ceiling would have been breached, 8 million jobs in this country alone were in jeopardy. When we were doing debt selling, the president had to go to G7 in Japan. Every every leader came up here, what's happening? What's oh, happening? Yeah. Every economy was on pins and needles. Uh, we could have a conversation without driving ourselves over a cliff. Uh, and I hope we learned that lesson. Uh, I'm optimistic, but I'll stay tuned. Um, but work groups like this are doing outside of that process, before that process, laying the groundwork for smarter conversations that are not just politics, um, will be helpful. So we can actually maybe pass policy that gets us to an end goal versus just yelling at each other about fiscal health. What, what does that mean? What can we be aiming for? Um, and I look forward to having that and, and, and maybe like getting some sleep during this. We want you to. I think that's the perfect note for us to end on and to get you home to your child on a time. I got to do daycare pickup. Uh, daycare I, you know, pickup. Ma- Mama brings home the bacon and yeah. cooks it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and thank you very much. Thank you.
And thanks to all of you all for attending today and for all of our panelists. It was a terrific discussion. And uh, thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Appreciate and it. all I've learned in appropriations, I'll give him about 80% credit, but Chuck Kiefer uh, over there. <laughs> yeah. All right. We've had a lot of shout outs to the team. Yeah. So, all right.